Hello, welcome to the HVMFC YouTube channel. What I would like for you to do is like and subscribe. Have a blessed day. Coming up on the Inspired Word. See, when you understand, okay, your good works are worthless before God, okay, without Jesus Christ, okay, without Jesus Christ, your, your good works are worthless. And, and that's hard to say that because a lot of people put a lot of money, they put a lot of time and effort to good works, but your good works will not save you. your Bibles, your notepads, your pencils, and paper as we get ready to get started. Family, we're getting ready to start a new series called Disruptive God. And today's topic is, can God get your attention? I'm going to go in and keep writing the scripture this morning because we have a lot to, a lot to cover. But man, I, I think we're going to have a great time with this one. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Psalms, Psalms 139, Psalms chapter 39, we're going to start in verse 7. And this week, person talking about God. The psalmist is talking about trying to hide from the Lord. We're going to pick up in verse 7. He says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed show, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, but darkness is as light with you, Lord. And when I really start thinking about this right here, where can a person hide from God? There's nowhere that you can hide from the Lord. I did this for many years. I tried to run from the Lord. I didn't want to do what he asked me to do. I, it's something when I look back, there is this old social media post, and it's just of a regular old poll, like a stop sign pole, and it's a guy as big as me, and he's trying to hide behind the stop sign pole, this little small thing. He thinks he's going to get his big butt and try to hide from his little thin pole. And then what the caption simply says is you trying to hide from God, simply meaning God can see you clearly. Okay, He knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly what you're doing. He knows exactly your actions, even your thought process. You can't even hide your thought process from the Lord. There's a scripture in the Bible that says even before you speak a thing, the Lord knows it's going to come out of your mouth. Now, the reason I'm starting with that, guys, today is because I want you to understand it's time for us to answer the call of the Lord and stop running from him. Now, if some of you guys may have answered that call already in your life, that is awesome. But now we're talking about answering the fullness of God's call on, on our lives, right? Doing the thing that God has called us to do. Some of us may be going to church on a regular basis. Some of us, you know, whatever, we may be attending meetings and doing all those good things. But are you doing what God has asked you to do? And I'm going to go there today because even when I was coming in into Christianity and, and I was going to church on a regular basis, I knew that God called me to do something different in my life. But I didn't want to leave what I was already doing before I felt this calling on my life. I liked the life I had been living. I had become settled in that life. And my life was working, you know, like clockwork, so to speak. Doing things on a regular basis like I know how to do them. But I, and I didn't want God to interrupt my life, meaning that my life was great with him being in the place that he's in and me being in the place that I am in. A lot of folks, you know, think this way. You know, Lord, we got a good relationship here. You know, I'm, I'm tithing and I'm doing all things like, like, like you've asked me to do. You know, I mean, and maybe even on the usher team at church, so to speak. But God has called you maybe to do a little more. God has called you to step out and maybe take on another position, to do a little bit more for him, maybe to be counseling, maybe to be helping in the church another way, maybe even to speak, be speaking and preaching, so to speak. Whatever it may be, he may be asking you to be a teacher within Sunday school. Whatever it may be, God has asked you maybe to go that extra mile. Not only in the church house, he may be having some of you guys to do something different, though, than you regularly do in the world. Because see, one thing about the Lord, the, the Lord will not just use you for the church house. The Lord is going to use you in the church house and also in the world to gather other people. Because folks in the church house, really, they're already supposed to be gotten, so to speak, correct? But folks out there in the world, okay, folks that don't know him yet, most time God is going to use you out there in those areas to gather folks that he cannot gather without you. God wants to use you. He wants to use you mightily. But are you willing to have your life disrupted? 
so God can use you. A lot of folks will say no to that. Okay, they don't say it naturally, but they say it in their actions. They don't answer the call. They won't do anything different. Why? Because they're comfortable in the situation they're in. And that's what I'm talking about today. You know, years, years before I started walking into this Christian life or walking as a Christian, okay, and doing what God asked me to do, I knew God had already called me to do something. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you how it first came into my life. In my early, I want to say maybe my late teens, my early 20s, I had already known that I'm supposed to be doing something within within church. And I I didn't know quite what it was. I'm going to tell you why. Because I wasn't even going to church. Okay, I, not at all. You know, but I had felt this something on the inside of me. So, you know, I need, I need to learn more about the Bible. I need to learn more about the Lord's Word. One day, I you know, even this, this thought process that one day I have to teach it. And I couldn't get it because I wasn't doing nothing for the Lord, man. I mean, when I tell you I was living in the world, guys, I was living in the world. I was doing worldly things like crazy. You know, me playing ball like I was playing ball and dealing with girls like I was dealing with girls. I was doing absolutely the wrong thing. And I'm saying this to you guys, and I want to be transparent about this right here because a lot of us, we won't move towards God because you think, how can God use somebody like me? Even when I used to have those thoughts and I'd be laying in the, in the bed, and I, I was like, you know, he like, that can't be God. Why would God use somebody like me? I'm, I'm just so jacked up in so many ways. I mean, I'm sitting right now. I'm, I'm sitting in this moment, and God, you're trying to really speak to me? And I didn't. So at first, I used to think, well, that's not God. But then as I started to get more understanding, I said, well, why would the devil tell me something like that? Why would the devil try to get me from stopping, stop, stopping sinning like I'm sinning? Okay, why would the devil try to get me to stop doing his, his work for him? Okay, and go do something for God. Then I, it finally hit me. Maybe it is God calling me. Maybe it is God trying to get me to move and do, you know, change my life and to be a person that, that's for him. But I couldn't understand it because at that time, I wasn't even sure, you know, Christianity was even right. As a matter of fact, I had met a few Christians and I didn't care so much for some of them that I said, man, I, I can't walk a life like that. Now, there were some great Christians that are people who lived Christian lives as far as I, I understood at that time, you know, and, and, they, and they walked in that life. And I, and I love that. that to me, they, they resembled what I thought a Christian life would be. They were non-judgmental. They, they, they really tried to help me move forward like me and my family or me and my girlfriend at that time. I should say this too, because I see how you can be a Christian. And, and to me, even though I didn't know what Christianity entailed, I just saw their heart and they showed love towards me. They weren't judgmental and things of that nature. But most of the folks I'm talking about right now, these are the folks. When I, I walked into a church one time, I don't know, I'll never forget it. It was in South Tucson, me and my girlfriend, and we had already had a baby at this time. And the way they was looking at us. My first thought process is anybody say something to me the wrong way, I'm getting ready to let them have it. Now, I'm giving you this right here because I want you to understand when God at first called me, he, he didn't call me as a Christian. Okay, he, he was calling me, from my understanding now, looking back, he was just trying to call me out of that old life. I had no Christianity in me. Okay, I didn't even understand what a Christian was. And so when he was giving me these thoughts and then giving me these ideas, you know, I, didn't, I couldn't even take it on the inside of me because, like, why would you use me? Why would you take someone like me, somebody who is so jacked up, I'm living sexually immoral, you know, I'm doing things I should not be doing on a regular basis. I'm drinking, I'm smoking, I'm doing all those things, mighty God, that, you know, probably you, you, you don't want this to show for Christianity. At least this is my thought process. Now, here I am, and yet he's still calling me. Now, I understood later on. This is just the love of God. I didn't understand it when he was giving me that calling or telling me about it. But this is how God, this is how much he still loves us. See, a lot of people are, right now, just give me this thought process. A lot of people, unfortunately, to listen, we listen to so many judgmental people. But when you really just, if, if you get somebody to tell the truth to you, God can call you, okay, no matter at what area of life you're at. You know, no matter how, how, in, in the downturn of your life, you know, in the low of your life, in the trials of your life, you may not even know him, but yet he can still call you. Why? Because he loves you. He wants you and he's seeking you. But I can tell you in my early, my late uh, teens and my early 20s, you know, even though I was having this, this, this to me, I wanna, I'm going to call it a call it now, but you know, this surge on the inside of me to do something different, I did not respond. And the reason I did not respond, because I truly did not think it was God calling me. He just couldn't. The other side of it is, well, why would he use someone like me? Okay, someone living in such a way. Someone who wasn't even proud of himself. And some of you guys have maybe uh, have read the, the book Wounded Soul. You understand, as, as a 19, 20, 21-year-old kid, I, I have more confusion on the inside of me than any, anything. 
And so me being so broken on the inside and to me being such a vast thing in my mindset and then I didn't have understanding, I just, in my thought process, I couldn't, there was nothing for me to do. So that time passed. Now, a little later, I come into around 24, 25 years old. I've talked to you guys about this more than a few times. How my wife at the time, she urged me to go to church with her and my, my son and, and my uh, youngest daughter, if I'm right. I think she was born at this time. And I'm bringing this portion of it up because, see, this is the time I was going to church. And I was going because, truthfully, I was trying to, like, tell them, like, church ain't not it. Now, this is going to sound bad coming from a pastor. But I'm a 25-year-old kid, and my thought process was, you know what, let me just go to church with, you know, with, with uh, my wife and, and Charles, little, my baby Charles. Because if I go to church, she going to understand this. This ain't really it. I, I mean, not, you know, some people just sitting there trying to hype us up to pay into this, pay into that, you know what I mean? Just, I'm not, I'm going to let them know this is a hustle. And that's really why I started going to church. And I started going to church with her and a guy who was cutting my hair. The guy, uh, he was a heck of a barber, but I love Mike. His name was Mike. Mike is such a good dude. But they literally helped me to start going to church. And when I started understanding more about, you know, the Bible, and understanding more about God, that was, now, this was, once again, was God calling me. I didn't understand it, but I knew now the same urge that I had as in my late teens, my early 20s, the same urge rose up on the inside of me, and it was even stronger this time. And this time, whatever it was, I held on to it. I finally gave my life to Christ. Uh, you know, I, I started understanding the Word of God as I started to read it and take it in on my own. I did continue going to church and things of that nature so I could learn from the pastor and the other teachers at church. But it took me a moment to get there. Why? Because at first, I was running from the Lord. I was running from the Lord. I already told you some of those reasons I was running from him. But I want you to also see this in the word of God. So many people, we, we get complacent in the things we do. We get complacent even in our great jobs. And when I say complacent or comfortable, what I simply mean, we are, we are running or, or going along on a structure, activity, that we do over and over and over and over again, we'll become used to it. And we start missing the signs that God is reaching out to us, missing the signs that God is trying to get us to do something different than what we normally normally do. And the reason most times that we, we miss it because we're comfortable in what we're doing. Okay, it's not that, that we don't even hear him sometimes. It's that we may hear, but no, nope, I ain't doing nothing different. I'm doing all I need to do. And my wife made this so plain to me one time because she says, you know what? When it comes to me, me having actions or doing certain things for my wife, she says, how can you ever really do enough? And what I simply mean by that, what she was telling me, she said, what I simply mean by this is that, you know what, I'm your wife. Okay, you should always be willing to do better for me. You know, go to the next step for me. And when I really got that in and took that in, I thought that same thing reversed with my wife. You know, you're right. You know, and I see you doing better, and I see you trying to step up your game towards me, so to speak. But when I got that on the inside of me, I realized this is the same thought process I must have for the Lord. I must grow. I must develop. I must become better. But it took me time once again to get here. Now, if you pick up in your Bibles, let's pick up in Exodus, Exodus chapter 3. And I think this is such a good, a great story where you can see the thought processes going on. You can see the, the entire story just, just being unfolded before us and where it's becoming real and becoming, uh, it's beginning to a place where we can see how God's vision is getting ready to become plain through Moses. But I want you to see everything that took place here. Right? So Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he had led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, if you look at this first verse, not a big deal, most people think. But I want you to understand, Moses is right on 80 years old or 80 years old at this time. Okay, This is normal. Moses was a shepherd. Okay, Moses was leading his sheep a certain way, okay? And the shepherds take care of their sheep. So when it's saying now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, okay, uh, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, Moses was going up about his daily work. Okay, this is something that he does all the time, daily, year after year, year after year. Now, the reason this is so important, because when God is getting ready to talk to Moses, see, Moses, at first, you know, when he's getting ready to see guys, you know, it, it wasn't the fire that caught him. I want you guys to notice this in verse, verse 2. It wasn't the fire that really got his attention. So pay really good attention to what's written in the Bible. Verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. 
He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. This is so important. Okay, in the desert, you guys have heard, probably heard me say this if you have watched me some time. Okay, things catch on fire all the time in the desert. Okay, things naturally, unfortunately, are combustible. But that's just what it is when, when things get real hot. They can catch on fire, especially for long periods of things that are like dry brush, things of that nature. I mean, it happens. It's a regular sight, so it's not new. So Moses seeing that thing catch on fire, okay, or be on fire, was not a big deal. Okay, the, the thing here that caused attention was, why is this bush okay, not being burned up? Why is this thing not ashes? See, the first thing when God is coming to you guys is probably going to be out of the ordinary, something that you're sensing. It's something that's different about this day. It's something that's different about this moment. It's something different about this minute that you're in. You know what? I'm, I'm running along the same cycle. I'm, I'm running in the same neighborhood. I'm running along the same streets. But this day, something is just a little bit different. It is catching my attention. And you're wondering why you're looking at it. Let me give you a thought process. I go on this freeway uh, that's not far from my house on a daily basis. I've been doing it for years. Years and years and years. I mean, this is the same freeway I go back and forth to work on. And I will never forget it. Back and forth to work each and every day. Each and every day. This day, I got on the freeway. And, you know, I, I have seen, you know, cars broken down on the freeway. Not a problem. You know, I, I've seen that so many times, especially when you go to good distance on the freeway. You'll see cars broken down on the freeway. I've seen trucks broken down on the freeway. I've seen trucks jackknife. On the freeway, you know, where Crane got to come and get them straight, or you know, to, to make sure they can get off the freeway. Now, I'm, I'm giving you this thought because this day, when I got on the freeway, I had just gotten on, and all of a sudden, I seen this. I think it had to be a truck, but it was a small truck. But this time, that's so this truck right here. I saw. I've seen cars catch on fire, but this truck, it was. I mean, when I say it was on fire, guys, it was encompassed. By fire. I've seen engine fires on the freeway. But this terrain, every part of it was on was on fire. It was so much on fire, I took my phone out. And the reason I took my phone is because I wanted to videotape something that I had never actually seen before. Because I've never seen a car this encompassed by fire. And, and the fire was so bad on this car, this car was completely black. black. The tires were already burnt out. I'm saying to myself, what was in that truck? To burn it up like that. You know, something in the in the trunk of, or in the, in the bed of the truck to help it catch on, you know, an extra fire. You know, it, it was something more than I've ever seen. So I paid distinct attention to it. As a matter of fact, I, if I'm being honest with you, or, rather I'll say it another way. As a matter of fact, being transparent with you guys, you know, I passed, you know, families on the freeway, you know, uh, that's been stranded, so to speak. I've, I've seen all kinds of things on the freeway. I, unfortunately, I've, been, I've even seen uh, um, a deceased person. Okay, laying out on the freeway. So I've seen some things in my life on the freeway. But this day, this time when I got on the freeway and I saw something, this, this truck on fire like it was, it just it caught my attention in a different way than anything has ever caught my attention on the freeway. And what I'm trying to get over to you right now is that when God is speaking to you, when God comes to you, when, when God is trying to, to get a hold of you, sometimes he may catch up with you and it's just... This little thing that's different, but it, you notice how it has your full attention. It's got you this day. It's got you this moment. It, you know, and he's trying to grasp hold of you. And this is probably the exact moment Moses is in. So then verse 4 picks up. When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. Okay, and he said, here I am. Verse 5. It says, then God said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I wanted you to see why God responded. See, when he saw that he could get Moses' attention, okay, then God gave him direction. A lot of times, God can't get our attention. And because he can't get our attention, he never gives us what the next step is. Right? If we come, become too comfortable in what we're doing, and we are never allow our head to, to be turned aside, so to speak. If we never decide to look for why God is, 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 is talking to us a little different this day, why God is trying to get a hold of us this day, when we say, you know what? If we're too comfortable to be interrupted by God, if we're too comfortable to be disrupted by his presence, we'll never get what he has for us. See, right here, once again, if you look at it, it says, when the Lord saw, saw that Moses turned aside 
to see what was going on. Then God caught him out of the bush. Family, I need you to hold on to that right now. I, I need you to get that. Some of you guys, God's calling you. He's been calling you. And he has been calling you for some time. But you refuse to turn aside. You refuse to hear what he has to say. But I'm telling you, this year, you know, this year as you move forward, in everything you do, okay, look for God's voice. Look for that, 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 that feeling on the inside of you. You know, when you can hear, you know, you know, you know when you know. When I simply mean by that right there, God knows how to reach you. God knows how to reach you, whether he reaches you through somebody else, whether he, whether he reaches you through some wonderful or, or uh, changing sight, so to speak. However it is, he knows how to reach you where you're at. There used to be this song, and I, oh my goodness, I forget who sung this song, but this was years ago now. But I, I still like the first portion of this song. He said, this guy, the, the singer opens the, the song with, I met God standing on a corner smoking a cigarette. That's his opening statement. I met God on the corner uh, smoking a cigarette. And when I first heard it, I'm like, oh, man, you, you blast me the Lord. And then, you know, that, that's crazy talk. But when I thought about what he was saying, okay, the God, the, the, sorry, the guy that introduced him to God, okay, was a person standing on the corner smoking a cigarette. See, God can reach you, okay, whatever circle you're in. God can reach you whatever hole you may be in. God can reach you whatever darkness you may be going through. God can reach you in, in the lows of your life. God can still reach you, but are you open to being reached? This is the question that you have to answer. You know, some of us are looking for certain things that happen in our lives, but we won't turn aside to see the new thing the Lord is doing. Because we won't turn aside, we will not see the deliverance of the Lord. Some of us have been waiting for God to enter into our lives. And I ask myself this all the time because as I pray for things and pray to move forward, sometimes I feel like, Lord, am I, am I missing you? You know, have you talked to me about this right here? You know, have, have I missed what you've asked me to do? And the reason I ask these questions is because I don't want to miss God. And this is the same thing that you guys have to do. As you continue to seek him, continue to want to hear his voice, continue to want you, him, to God to lead you in the direction that he will have you to go. But you must be willing to turn aside. You must be willing to allow God to disrupt your day. If you're not willing to have God disrupt your life, guess what? He cannot use you. That's hard. But hear me out. God cannot use you if you're too busy to be used. I sat here for years and I... I was, a, you guys know, I was a government contractor for years, and as you know, me working and, and me doing the things that I did for the government, you know, I, I got to a place where they, I was just running, you know, running on regular always. But I simply mean by doing, doing the same thing over and over and over again. You know, hey, putting out fires, solving problems. That's just what I did. Now I, it became so good as you know, it took me to, you know, I, I want to say high levels within the company to do this work. But I'm so thankful. That I finally got to a place where I can allow God to use me. I can allow God to disrupt my life because at first I wouldn't like that. I wouldn't like that at all. As a matter of fact, it was very difficult to interrupt my life. As a matter of fact, anybody to interrupt my life, even my wife. And, you know, I, I failed at some things when I was doing that work. Why? Because I became complacent. And not complacent at work. I became complacent with other things. I became complacent with my spouse, complacent raising my kids, complacent doing things uh, I should not have done, so to speak. I, I became complacent. Okay, it became so complacent you couldn't you couldn't tell me nothing. Okay, I became big headed in some areas. You know, you could act, you could disrupt my day because my day ran like this. Okay, if you wanted me to get mad at you, disrupt my day, right? And because that pride was on the inside of me that you couldn't disrupt my day because I knew everything I needed. I knew how to take care of myself and I knew how to make sure I took care of my family. And because of that, guess what? I had it all. I had it all. As a matter of fact, dare to say I was my own god. Because I didn't need anybody else. No matter, I was making great money, great money. Okay, so much great money, so to speak. I had multiple houses. I had things over here, things over here. I mean, I, I, I can't only really tell you guys, I lived this way and I lived it for years. So yes, it was difficult for me to be disrupted. But I had finally come to a place where God could down, I, he, he could seek me and I would listen. But it took me time to get there. But I had to allow myself to be disrupted so I can have God put me on the path that he wanted me on. Now, I'm going to tell you right now why I didn't want to be disrupted by God. Because I was afraid that God was going to change my life. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Because this is a sticking point for a lot of us. We are so afraid that God's going to change our life, we rather ignore God. Okay, we don't want to go to church. We don't want to read his word because we know we're accountable to God. 
So if I can ignore him long enough where, you know, where I, I, I feel I can't hear him no more, I feel I can run from his presence, okay? I, I don't want to show up in one of his places, his places of worship. I don't want to hear from his people. That's how he run. And I did this. Okay, I continue to run. I, I continue to ignore because I didn't want my life changed. Living my life like I was living as far as I was concerned, this was good with me. Now, I didn't realize it all that, but I was also serving the devil. Now, this is difficult because a lot of people say, well, I wasn't a bad person. Matter of fact, I would have said, I wasn't a bad person. Okay, I, I thought I was a pretty good dude, honestly. I, I really do know that. But I, I didn't understand okay, how God valued things. I didn't, I didn't understand how God judges things. I didn't understand how God sees things. Because see, me calling myself good, that will not save anybody. Okay, they wouldn't even save me. I want you guys to understand that right now. A lot of people will say, you know, you know, God knows my heart. We got to be so careful with statements like that. Okay, if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, okay, not make him Lord and Savior of your life, okay, the good things that you do for other people, scripturally speaking, they're filthy rags. They're worthless. They will count for nothing. When you face God, you're going to face him on your own and not with Jesus. Let me tell you what saves us. It's the blood of Jesus that saves us. It's the blood of Jesus that allows us to get to heaven. But if you don't know those things, it's easy to, you know, think of the self-righteous things that you do. Because I, I was out there giving to the homeless. I was out there, you know, giving to some charities. I was out there, you know, trying to help folks. Matter of fact, you know, I, I thought my heart was in the right place. Unfortunately, I was doing all these things without Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm so thankful okay, that I did not die in that time frame. Because if I would die in that time frame, here it is again, I would have faced the Heavenly Father without the Lord's blood covering over me, and I would have been damned to hell because of it. See, when you understand, okay, your good works are worthless before God, okay, without Jesus Christ, okay, without Jesus Christ, your, your good works are worthless. And, and that's hard to say that because a lot of people put a lot of money, they put a lot of time and effort to good works, but your good works will not save you. They won't save you. But when you think that you're doing good on your own and you let that self-righteousness build up on the inside of you, you don't think you need God for anything. And that's exactly when, in, in the place in which I was at at one time. Hey, I was doing good on my own. Why do I need God to come in and interrupt my life? And because I feared that he was going to change it, Okay, even though I knew I, I, I found that I was right, he did change my life, and God will change your life. I'm going to tell you right now, don't even lie to you. Okay, when you give your life to God, God's going to change your life. Why? Because he wants your life to line up with his word. Okay, he wants you to be the Christian where he is Lord over your life. That means master. Okay, if he means if you have a master, you have somebody that tells you what to do. Okay, God is, is remember guys, I need you guys to get this too. Okay, what God is having us to do, what God tells us to do, family actually frees us. It frees us from the bonds and, and, and the sins of Satan. And, and it, free, it frees us from things that we're attached to that we shouldn't be attached to. And this is how Satan, he, he gets us a lot of times, right? I mean, for instance, you know, if we think about sexual immorality, and I said that earlier about myself, you know, uh, dealing with ladies and things of that nature as a, as a, uh, as a teenager and as a grown, uh, my young adult age, you know, as I was going through things like that right there, I didn't think I was bound. I didn't think I was bound by, by anything. As a matter of fact, I thought I was living in freedom when I was living like that right there. Doing what I wanted to do, to what people I wanted to do it with, so to speak. You know, and it's something. When you start to learn about things like this right here, when you start to get God's understanding regarding things like this right here, you realize how bound you truly are. Okay, you, you realize how Satan, you know, will uh, give you this thought process where you think you're free, but all of a sudden, you know, you, you can get, even at my time, I think, you know, people, you know, come up with AIDS. People can come up with, with diseases they can't get rid of. People would come up with things, you know, that would sit there and put them in this bind. They'd be imprisoned by this life. Some of them even lost their lives because of it, because of things that can happen like this right here. But yeah, if I was doing it God's way, I would have never had an issue with that because I wouldn't have gotten to that, into that place. I would have gotten there and doing things the right way, okay, with the right person, and I never had to face those things. But when you don't think that way, when you don't have that understanding, you think, man, you know, he's trying to stop me from doing what I want to do. And that right there, that, that, that freezes a lot of us. Because we want to live our lives like we want to lead them. Okay, we don't want nobody to lead our lives or tell us what to do. And when we think about it, or when we look at it that way, rather, that means we don't want a God in our life. We just want to be God of our own lives. If we ever get to a place, or if we stay, or we stay rather, in a place where we God in our own lives, that means we reject the living God. Okay, if we reject him, okay, there's no salvation for us. Amen? Amen, amen. So we have to be so careful uh, when we're so comfortable, okay, that we, we can't turn to the side. We, we can't listen to God's calling on our lives. Matter of fact, we can't even answer God's call just to be, you know, give our lives to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
You know, guys, that's just the first step. That's the first step. So we, we, if we've already taken that first step, we are giving our lives. We still got to listen. Why? Because God still wants to work in our lives and get us to a place where he wants us to be. Even through Moses, I already told you, he, he's right now. He's getting ready to tell, talk to Moses and tell Moses what he needs to do to fulfill his purpose in this lifetime. Now, it's crazy when I say this right here because Moses is 80 years old. And Moses is just now getting ready to learn the fullness of the purpose that God has for him. Okay, let's pick up in Exodus 3, 6. Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. And God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Now let me give you this thought process. Moses has probably already heard some stories, okay, of the Lord. Okay, of the wonderful God that have done some miraculous things. So right now we know Moses is already in fear because Moses is not, you know, right now there's no angel in front of Moses. Okay, there's nobody that Moses can actually see. There's just this bush that does, that's on fire that's not burning up. So I'm not sure if the voice is coming from the, from the bush. Okay, it would sound like it or it would look like it from scripture standpoint. But I'm giving you this thought process right now because once God identifies who he is, it says Moses was afraid to look at God. He was afraid. Okay, why would he be afraid? He knows this being he's talking to right now. He may not know the fullness of this being, but he knows this being is more powerful than he is. He knows this being is greater than he is. As a matter of fact, now he's telling him right now, okay, I am the God of your forefathers. Okay, I'm the one that kept them. I'm the one that left them. I'm the one that took them out of destruction or, you know, left them away from destruction. I am the one who protected them and delivered them. So he, Moses already understands that, you know, this God is mighty. This God is powerful. Verse 7, this is, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know the sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of the land to, to a good and broad land and a land flowing with milk and honey to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Preserites, the Hibites, and the Jebusites. Oh my goodness. Let's look at verse 8. The first thing verse 8 kicks off when he says, and I have come down. Hear what I'm saying right now. And I have come down to deliver them. See, God has already put this plan in place. So I have come down. God himself is saying, and I have come down. Even though he's talking to Moses, he says, I have come down to deliver them. Okay, one thing about the Lord working through us, you know, I want you guys to understand whatever God's, you know, a plan is for him to work through people, for him to work through rather, God's going to do this based on what he said he was going to do. Okay, God loves working through people who are willing. See, the, it was, here we're going back again. Okay, Moses turned aside and God talked to him. Okay, now Moses get the next steps. Now, these may be some harsh next steps because Moses does not know what this is going to entail, but yet here he is. He's hearing God. Okay, he's listening to him, and God is making this vision plain before Moses right now. I have come down to deliver my people out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them out of a land to a good and broad land and flowing with milk and honey. Isn't that something? God is saying right now, Moses, can he just tell him Moses? He ain't told Moses what he's going to do yet. So do you hear what I'm saying? Moses does not know exactly where he is in God's plan, okay, but he just knows God is talking to him. A lot of times when God is outlaying his, or uh, I'm sorry, is giving us his vision, okay, God's going to give us his vision. We don't know the fullness yet of our part in that vision. See, sometimes God may give us an individual vision. What that means is simply is that God is telling us something that we may lead, or God may tell us something that we need to attach ourselves to a, this group right here to pull off this vision. See, even though he's telling Moses this right here, we also understand that God is going to get Aaron to work with Moses as he starts to go out and start doing the work God called him to do. Amen? Amen. Now, pay attention to the Latin. I want to say about halfway through, right when we get past the land flowing with milk and honey, Look what God tells Moses. See, he's going to basically take, it, take his people to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So God already knew that he's going to take the Israelites to the promised land, okay, where people already were. Hear me now. This is such a huge deal. God never said the place was empty. As a matter of fact, God told him numerous people were in this land that I'm getting ready to give you. Isn't this something when you read it from this portion of the Bible? Because see, when you get to a place where God is actually taking the Israelites, getting ready to walk to the promised land, they were actually in fear of these people. 
And they were in fear of these people. As a matter of fact, they thought so small of themselves. They said, we are grasshoppers before them. Because the Israelites saw a lot of these people as giants. Okay, people that they could not defeat. But when God was talking to Moses right now, before anything is really laid out before anybody other than Moses, God is already telling Moses, these people are, are already here, but this is the land I'm giving to you. So you already know God has put a plan in place to remove this people. Okay, this is just something for you guys that love to study the Bible. That's just a fact that you guys need to hold on to or, or a teaching moment, so to speak, that you have. Understand, God already knew it was there. Okay, God's telling you, you know, right now, telling Moses, you're going to lead the Israelites into the promised land where these people already are. So he already has a plan, you know, to do something with those people. That's what you see right now. Here we go. So then verse, verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 9. It says, And now, behold, the crowd of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, and I will send you to Pharaoh. Uh-oh. Moses now knows, knows his part of God's plan. <laughs> Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, I love this portion. Because here we got in verse 8, God says, I have come down to deliver my people. Then verse 10 gives Moses his specific instructions. It says, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Then but Moses responds, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you. This is God talking. I want you guys to hear this right now. With everything in you, whatever you're facing right now in your in your life, whether you're in the room alone, whether you're crying right now, maybe you got this 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 hurt on the inside, and you maybe maybe you think you're not good enough. Whatever it is, I want you to understand this next thing right here in verse twelve. He says, "God said, but I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you." See, I want you guys to get this on the inside of you. I don't care what you're going. Okay, what the hardship is, you know, what the pain is, you know, what the suffering is. One thing I know about those of us who belong to the Lord, those of us who seek Him, those of us who trust in Him, I need you to get over on the inside of you right now that God is going to be with you. He promised to never leave you nor forsake you. This is His word that we already have. Moses at this time, he didn't know God like that. He, he didn't know God would never leave you nor forsake you because he didn't know enough about God at this point. Matter of fact, this is just the beginning point with Moses and the true God, amen? But when you start to really understand who God is and how he was with Moses, how he carried him, how he, he delivered him, how he led him, how Moses trusted him because he had to trust in him. See, some of us have gotten to a place in our lives where if we don't trust God, we got nothing. We got nothing. God, if you don't help me get this together, we're not, we're not gonna be here. God, if you don't help me to, to, to get this relationship problem me and my wife have, if you don't help me with this right here, this relationship's going to be over. God, all I have is, is you to, to rebuild this relationship. God, all I have is you to, to build this relationship with my children. God, all I have is, is you to build my business. God, all I have is you to deliver me out of the things that unfortunately I've gotten myself into. But I want you to understand God is a deliverer. That's who God is. God is a provider. That's who God is. God is a healer. That's who God is. And when we start to get in, get this on the inside of us, this is our Father. This is our Father. This is somebody who loves us. How do I even explain this, Father? I'm going to try the best way I can. And I'm going to try for the thought process of me as a father. You know, when it comes to my son, and my daughters, you know, I, it's not too much I want to do for my son and my daughters. It's not. Even though they make mistakes, even though they get on my nerves, I mean, did I say get on my nerves? I would say get on my nerves, even though I, 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 I love them still. Even though they fall short, even sometimes they don't listen, even sometimes they don't even be respectful, sometimes they can be dishonorable, but yet because I'm their father, when they call for help, because I'm their father, I help them. When they need me, and I, and I know they need me, I'm there. What can I do? I'm their dad. You know, God has given me these children to help them. You know, yes, some of them are grown, but I'm still, I'm still their dad. Yes, so I, I realize sometimes they have to learn hard lessons. And I do my best to make sure they learn these lessons. But the other side of it is I can't let it go too far. I can't. No. My son will never be homeless. Not as long as I have a home. 
My, 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 my dogs will never be hungry, not as long as I have food. As long as I have food, they're going to be fed. Okay, they, they may have not always done the right thing, but yet, here I am, I'm still their father. I'm still the one that cares for them, the one that loves them, the one that's willing to help them to be okay, to come out and be in a good situation. That's who I am. I'm their father. Now, imagine this God. This God who's all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing, has all these wonderful attributes, and yet he calls himself our Father. See, when I think about this right now, I, I got to be so careful because when I, I understand the goodness of God. Even through the struggles, through the hardships, through the trials, through the pain, you know, through, through all these things, I understand he is my Father and that he loves me. He loves me. You know, sometimes I don't do I, I, I like everything he allows me to go through. No. Don't need me to lie to you. No. Okay, I don't like everything my Heavenly Father allows me to go through. Okay, I know he has a purpose in these things. I, I get that. But do I like him? No. Sometimes I think he allows things to go too far. I, I do. Okay, I, I do. I feel like, Father, you could have came earlier. I wouldn't have to lose this right here. Father, if you would have came earlier, I wouldn't have to go through that portion right here. You know, I, I realize his timing is perfect, but it's perfect to him. It's not always perfect to me. Sometimes he allows me to go through things that hurt me, and they, they deeply hurt me. You know, sometimes, you know, I feel like, Father, you, you, you allow me to be wounded in such a way, you know, and, and, and have this scar upon me that, that I did not want. But I also realize that scar shows that I was a victor. That, sharp, that scar shows that I was an overcomer. That, that, that scar shows that, you know, I'm still here and, and he, he healed me. I want you guys to get this because, see, dead bodies don't heal. Hope you understand that right now. Hope you get what I just said. Dead bodies don't heal. Dead bodies decay. So for us who may have scars all over us, who us, may, we may have been wounded in some way, some form. We may have internal wounds even, but yet we have these scars. And every time I see a scar, you know, every time I, I, I even look at some of the things I have to go through internally, but yet there's, there's a healing there. I realize my God is for me. And he loves me. Okay, he never let anything come and overpower me, just take me and destroy me. He, he's here for me because he's my father. There's a scripture in the Bible. I know it's in 1 Corinthians, and I can't remember the exact chapter right now, but you guys can find it. But it says, no temptation has overcome me, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will, not allow me, who will not allow me to be tempted above my abilities. And in his faithfulness, he will allow a way of escape that I may bear. That simply says to me, my God will not allow anything that's too much for me to overtake me. He'll be there with me. Simply saying that he's only going to let it go so far. Just like I was talking about my children. I'm only let it go so far. Yes, I want them to learn a lesson, so I, but I still... I will only let it go so far because I'm not going to let something come into a place of my children if I can. Okay, with the powers that's on the inside of me. Okay, I'm not going to, if I have the power to, to not let something destroy them, you think I'm going to let it destroy them? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Your father feels the same way about you. And that's what that scripture tells me. It tells me, hey, okay, I have a purpose for your life. I put you here for a reason. Don't you know that I love you? But yet sometimes this is the person we're running from. This is the person, you know, our God is our, our Heavenly Father is the person that we don't want to answer his call. Here he is, Moses, once again. He's getting the fullness of his purpose at 80 years old. And God is saying, I'm not sending you by yourself. Isn't it something? Hey, I'm not, and he's not talking about any other human right now. I'm not sending you by yourself. Because he wants you to know that I will be with you. And the beauty of every time I see this in scripture, I will be with you. I know that the Lord is getting ready to deliver me. And this is, you know, get this, and you don't even see this. I'm a matter of fact, let me switch to Jeremiah just for a moment. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1 4. I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1 4. And this is God talking to Jeremiah. So I, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Then Jeremiah says, Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you and to say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you. Did you see that? There it is again. I am with you. When you hear God tell you this, family, this is just like, <laughs> this is Jesus right next to you. 
This is Jesus right behind you, you know, kind of pushing you forward, making sure you're strong, girding you up. You know, I, I want you guys to get this. And a matter of fact, what God said that Jeremiah in verse 8, says, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you. I will rescue you. I remember when I was going off to college. And actually, this is actually before I was going off to college. Actually, before I was going off to college, I remember, so I can't, man, I was already in, in my new room. It had to be maybe a few years then, a few years before I went to college, maybe two, maybe about two years before I went to, off to college. And I remember my dad, he had brought me my grandfather's Bible. I didn't even know my grandfather's, I knew my dad had a Bible, but I thought it was his Bible. I didn't realize that was my grandfather's Bible. And once again, you're talking to this young man who wasn't really Christian, who didn't really understand the word of God. But he had told me how my grandfather, my grandfather loved this specific verse or the specific chapter of the Bible, and it was the 91st Psalms. And I have never forgotten it because my dad told me, Charles, when you ever get scared, when you ever, you know, get too, too much fear comes upon you, start reading the 91st Psalms. My dad, you know, he my, my dad said, my dad taught me to read this because it talks about God's protection. And for those of us who love him, how, you know, when you truly love God, he will make sure that rescue you and that, and that you come out okay. And so now, guys, once again, me going back to about 15, 16 years old when my dad gave me that Bible, I read that scripture all the time especially with some of the things I was going through. Now, this wasn't a person at the time. At this time in my life, guys, I can tell you, I needed a lot of help, especially a lot of internal help in my life uh, from some of the things that I was going through. And I was hoping God would help me. I was hoping God would see me through this so I could be a little better in some of the things that I was dealing with. But guys, as I would read this scripture, I realized that I would have peace through it. And so I would read it all the time, over and over and over. I would just read the 91st Psalms. As a matter of fact, even still to this day, the 91st Psalms is one of my favorite, favorite chapters in the Bible. And it's really just what it says. Because when you get to the end of the chapter or near the end of the chapter, it says, he holds fast to me in love. So the person who holds fast to the Lord in love, God says, I will deliver him. And every time I look at that, he said, I will deliver him. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, should I satisfy him and show him my salvation? I think my heavenly, when I think about how my heavenly father is talking to me regarding this word, the word that he gave his people. And when I personalize the word that he gave his people to me, I realize my Lord is here to deliver. He's going to deliver me. He's not going to leave me out in the cold. He's not going to leave me to, to a place where I, I cannot be. He's going to make sure I'm taken care of. You know, like scripture, like the young lions suffer and lack, but those that seek the Lord shall not want for any good thing. Scripture tells me when I was, I was young and now I'm old. You know, I, I love this portion because it's, I was young and now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. These are promises. These are promises. That was King David talking. King David was talking from his experiences, all the things he had to go to. He said, I was a young man, now I'm an old man. He said, but... Those who are righteous, those who kept God in the forefront, those who held to his word, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. See, these are promises that I need to hold on to. So then why am I running from a good God? Why am I running from my Heavenly Father when I know he is for me? See, I realize that people who don't know God know anything about him. I, I, I realize where they may, can be, may be, can run from God. But those of us who call ourselves Christian and are reading his word, why are we not doing what God has asked us to do? But yet we're in a place, in, in a moment, where we're not following what God is asking us to do. So basically we're not turning aside because we can't disrupt our lives. We know we can't be used. And so we're not getting that next step. And I even question sometimes when I feel like I'm stuck in the area, Lord, am I not turning aside to see what you have to say to me? Because if I'm in that place right now, Lord, help me come out of this position. I want to be better. Okay, I want to know you for who you are because I do want to walk into that next step. Because I do want to walk into the thing that you would have me do, even though it may be difficult. I realize, guys, in my own life, in my own life, when, God, when I got my calling on my life, when God gave me my next step, at first I didn't want to do it. I got to be so honest, I, I was kind of like Moses a little bit or Jeremiah. Yeah, I was afraid. Father, people are going to look at me and they're going to know how fallen I was in certain parts of my life. They would know I'm not, I haven't been perfect or even close to perfect. As a matter of fact, my God, when they look into my life, they're going to say how dirty, how truly dirty I am. And once they see that, God, they, who's going to listen to me? Who would want to hear anything from me? Especially this person. 
I got a, I got a, a couple of good friends, married couple. Let me tell you how wicked, how wicked I was. They had recently had given their guy, they had given their lives to Christ as Lord and the Savior. And this is when I was young, probably my, my early 20s, it had to be. Because this is before I became Christian. And as they talked to me about them giving their lives, they started talking to me. I actually started talking to them. How they know God? About talking to them about how they really knew that God was the way, that Jesus was the way. And I had gave them a couple concepts I understood at that time. You, you know, and I confused them so badly. They actually start th thought about, you know, turning away from Christianity. Because they were young Christians. They, and they couldn't answer the questions that I was asking them. That confused them to a point where they wanted to go back and, and you know, maybe this is not the life for us. That really happened. I actually did that. You know, and I took pride in doing that for some odd reason. And, and it's something. I can go back now and I can see the wickedness in that. But at the time, I just didn't have any understanding. And I'm saying all this because... I helped to turn people away from Christianity. And now I'm here teaching about it, preaching about it. You know, when God first gave me my call, then I thought I was, was not worthy. And I'm not really necessarily saying I'm worthy now. I just know by the blood of Jesus, he cleanses me because I'm not perfect. Okay, I, I'm not whole without Christ Jesus. But yet, because I've given my life, and Jesus has cleansed me on the inside. His righteousness has now been put on me. Simply saying that I'm only worthy to do this because of Jesus and Jesus alone. Okay, I can't go in on my own accord. I can't go in on my own self-righteousness. As a matter of fact, my own self-righteousness, that's the very thing that kept me not worthy of doing this. I do this because God has called me to do it. But at first, I didn't want to do it because I thought, Lord, I'm just look at me. Look at my life. Now that I understand better. I realize it's us who are stepping out on this word, us doing what God tells us to do. We are the ones that's going to change the world for him. Okay, we are the ones that's going to gather those who are still lost. But we have to do our part. Okay, God is not a respecter of persons. What that simply means is the calling that he gave us in our life. He expects us to fulfill it. Okay, but we have to allow God to disrupt our lives. Family, we are not done. We are not done with this sermon series, so I'm going to pick back up where I left off next week because we got so much to go. I, I barely basically got through the first, about maybe the first page and a half, so we, we got a lot to discuss, especially in this series because it's time for us to hear from God. But we'll only hear from God if we allow God to disrupt our lives. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for this day, mighty God. I thank you, Father, for giving us your wisdom and your understanding. I thank you, mighty God, that your word imparts the very things needed on the inside of us, mighty God, so that we can step up and step out and do what you've called us to do. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us in the only way you can. Thank you, mighty God, for not giving up on us. Thank you, Father, for saving our families, saving them, mighty God, for some of the thoughts, some of the things that we have done. Thank you, Lord, for just your saving grace. I thank you, Father, for your mercy. I thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you, Jesus, for being faithful in all things. In Jesus' name we pray we say amen, amen, amen. Well, family, I'm going to see you next week. Oh, I'm super excited about this. Take care, family. Have a blessed day. Bye. If you're in the sound of my voice this morning and you want to know Jesus Christ for the very first time, Romans 10 9 simply states that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. So if that's you this morning, you want to meet Jesus for the very first time, simply declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead. If that's you this morning, you now belong to the kingdom of God. That's the first step. But there's a powerful second step that you must take. Okay, it's The second step is your transformation to become a disciple of Christ. Okay, For you to transform, you have to pick up the word of God and start reading it, start taking it in. To get with a good Bible-based church, so the people, the people there can help you to become the person that you're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. If you can't find nobody in the area in which you're in, you can always find us at harvestvillage.org. Okay, you can email us at admin at harvestvillage.org. And that should be on the bottom of your screen, admin at harvestvillage.org. Amen? Amen. For any reason you may have stepped away from the Lord, okay, and you're looking to come back, 1 John 1, 9, simply says the Lord is faithful to forgive all those who ask for forgiveness. So repent. Turn away from what you're doing and turn back towards God. Ask for forgiveness. The Lord is ready to put you back in your rightful position. Amen. Also, get with a good Bible-based church as they continue to help you to find the Lord okay, and walk in his truthfulness. 
Well, family, that's all I have for you this week. Thank you for joining me this morning. Okay, thank you for listening to the word. Thank you for studying the word. And have a blessed day, family. Bye.